It's Heal Heat time. Hi everybody and welcome to Heal Heat. My name is George Coles and this is our TNA show for the week. Let's jump right into it. We'll start off with the so-so portions. Basically the stuff that wasn't bad, it wasn't good, it was just there. Uh, the promo between MVP's group, him, Lashley, and Kenny King. Where we get Bobby Roode coming out to challenge with Lashley. He gets jumped, brings out Eric Young and Austin Aries. Not that it was terrible, it's just so derivative and repetitive of what they do every week. They do a promo just like this every single week. It, if it's not interesting and it's not fresh, it's boring. Which leads me to the second part on this. Same thing comes out with the beautiful people cutting the heel promo. Taryn Terrell comes out, Gail Kim comes out. Bam, cookie cutter formula, followed for yet another promo, setting up yet another match. Just my opinion, give us something fresh, give us something different every now and again. You don't, I'm not saying you have to go away with this, this is a tried and true thing in wrestling, it goes back through the ages. Every wrestling show ever has had some form of this. However, let's, let's spice it up, let's you know, do it a little bit different. Let's, you know, give us something so we're not bored by it. Now, coming off of that, we're going to go to our bad portion of the week. And really, the only thing I honestly thought was bad, just outright bad in the show, was the finishing segment with Dixie Carter. She came out with her crew, and we all know what it led to. Bully Ray finally putting Dixie through the tape. Now, as I mentioned on last week's show, and I gave a lot of reasons why I disliked it then, I will tell you again why I dislike it now. First off, we knew a week ahead of time that this was going to happen. Ruins the surprise factor. Secondly, again, the fervor isn't as high as it was last week about the Ray Rice issue. But there's still murmurs going around. There's still that going where man-on-woman violence is being questioned. And here we have, in your prime time, prime spot, man-on-woman violence. To me, I mean, the, the, the spot itself... Bully Ray took the whole table. She didn't even hit the table. If anything, she might have got whiplash from hitting the mat. And, and you know, I'm a huge Bully Ray fan. I'm a big Team 3D fan, Tommy Dreamer fan. But the whole setup and the whole thing, it just... It leaves a bad taste in my mouth. For all the reasons I mentioned last week, them letting us know ahead of time... The man-on-woman violence, especially in the context of what's going on in the local, you know, in the news as of late. Just to me, it, it, it was kind of in bad taste, in my opinion. Next up, we're going to go right into our question of the week. Now, the question of the week from last week was, do you think that TNA should only book in hot towns like they've been in New York for a while and the town's been hot and town, the crowds have been excited and you know it carries through onto the screen where whereas uh, you know most companies will go and you'll go to different towns every week and you'll end up some places and I'm not trying to knock any town anywhere I'm just giving an example let's say you're in Tupelo Mississippi this week and in Tupelo the crowd's going crazy. They're they're coming across on TV. They're chanting. They're yelling. They're booing. They're cheering. It's making the product better. But next week, you're in Biloxi, Mississippi. Crowd's not as engaged. 
Now, I don't know if Tupelo, I'm just giving examples of two things in the same state. I don't, I'm not trying to pick on any specific geographic area, but we do know that there's some areas where professional wrestling plays to the crowd better than others, specifically in America, where, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> specifically in the shows that we see in American wrestling, you got towns like Chicago, Philadelphia, New York, always play well. Always get a good crowd. Boston to some extent as well. Always get a good crowd. Always get good reactions. Then you add some of the international cities like uh, Toronto, London, England. Anything they do in Australia is they just go crazy there because the product comes there so infrequently that it makes it you know, an exciting thing. The question, now, going back to what I was actually getting on to, the question of the week was, should TNA only run their shows in these hot towns till they get a more foothold and get start building better ratings? Now, we have some answers from our friends here. First is from Zombies40. Any place where fans actually like wrestling is a good place to go. I think going places where there aren't many wrestling fans or just most casual WWE fans is a place TNA should skip. Fair enough. Next up, our friend Silver84. TNA should go to cities where wrestling is still popular. I think that those crowds appreciate wrestling a lot more in random cities in the middle of... That, more than random cities in the middle of nowhere. Next is from Benjamin Me 19 Hey, Heel Heat, for this week's question of the week. I think that TNA should stay in the areas where they will draw a good crowd. I don't know whether Spike TV have offered them anything or nothing, but if they have offered them anything, they should take it to stay on TV. Then they should think about staying in areas where they will draw a crowd in. It would be ideal to build a TNA territory in those towns because it's a guaranteed full house, and then they could concentrate on increasing TV ratings and negotiating better contract with Spike TV further down the line. They should also scrap PAL shows and lower pay-per-views to three to four a year, which will bring pay-per-view worthy matches to TV, which will increase the rating, which will increase their negotiating skills with Spike TV, and that's pretty much turning a frown upside down. I think they've already came down to where it's only four pay-per-views a year. I might be wrong. They do do some pay-per-view versions of Impact with all the other pay-per-views they've dumped. Last but not least, our friend at AUP116. Yes, they should stay and stay the shows have probably been the best since 2006. I would like to see them come to Atlanta because that's the closest they have, the, because the closest they have come is Duluth. But I want them to have a show at Phillips and see what the draw is like. I don't know if it's feasible for TNA to go into the Phillips arena at this point. Um, I believe... You know, I, I could be wrong. Uh, the, the building can hold upwards of 30,000 people. For a company that's struggling to, to get 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 5,000 to show up, you don't want to put a, a company that sells 5,000 tickets in a 30,000 seat arena. Even though 5,000 is a great draw, and if you're booked in a smaller arena, it looks amazing. Part of what's made the Hammerstein Ballroom special in when they played in Allentown a few months back is the fact that the show was sold out. Well, it was sold out because there's 1,500 tickets, 2,000 tickets. If you go to a place like the Phillips Arena that holds 30,000, and let's say they sell 15,000, you still got a half full arena. That comes across on TV as a half full arena. That comes across quiet because the sound carries further and you don't hear as much of the fans. Now, can they build up to that? Yes, of course they can. At one point, you had WWE and WCW going all across the United States and Canada and trips outside, going to these huge 
stadiums, hockey to hockey rink or hockey stadiums, basketball stadiums, baseball stadiums, football stadiums, and filling them up every week. Two companies going crisscross nationwide. Now you only have one, you have WWE. So there is historical precedent precedent that it could be done. They have to build to that first. Thing. I would like to see them go into Atlanta. I think Atlanta is one of those towns that if they're given and and the here's the kicker with a town like Atlanta, and it's the same thing with other towns like that I've spoke of, Philadelphia, Chicago, New York. Memphis, all the great wrestling towns. If you give them a quality product, the fans will give you quality reaction. If you give them a shit product, the fans will give you a shitty reaction. They go to Atlanta, if they can have if they bring a quality product to Atlanta, Atlanta's gonna respond. And Atlanta's gonna come out in force. Atlanta is a hotbed. People seem to forget that they're that WCW is based out of Atlanta. Before that, Jim Crockett Promotions, which did the Carolinas, also covered Atlanta, and also Georgia Championship Wrestling, were some of the biggest promotions in the country back in the territory days. Now, how this all ties into the question I was saying is, everybody knows where the big areas are, everybody knows I don't know if TNA people do, but there's some people in that office that could go, hey, Dixie, let's stick to work in these general areas. We'll work Philadelphia this week, we'll work New York next week, we'll go to Chicago, we'll go to Toronto, you know, maybe we'll do something in Detroit, we'll go to Atlanta, we'll go to Memphis, places where wrestling has historically been a huge draw. And, and I agree with her. I think the better the crowd is, the better it makes your product look. If you have a crowd like, one of the thing, problems they had with the Impact Zone, it was in Universal Studios in Orlando, Florida. It was a free ticket. Now, I don't live too far away from there. I went there a few times. And literally, as you're standing in line, because you'd have to stand in line for quite a while, of course, it's a free ticket. You know, people would come a couple hours early to make sure they could get in. But you would hear, as you're standing in line, young kids with their fathers or mothers, is John Cena going to be here tonight? Well, I don't know. It's wrestling. He might be here. Obviously, you would hear things like that. Is, you know, so-and-so going to be here? Is CM Punk going to be here? Is John Cena? Because that's what they're conditioned as wrestling. These are not TNA fans. These are people that went to the park, seen that there was going to be a wrestling show. The only pro wrestling they know is WWE. They go in. They don't know any of the talent. They don't know who to cheer. They don't know who to boo. They don't know who's a heel. They don't know who's a face. They don't know what the angle leading up to this was. All they see is what's being presented in front of them, and the crowd ends up dead and listless. That was one of the products, one of the problems with having the product stay in one place and giving away free tickets. Is you got casual fans that knew nothing of the product. On the flip side, you go to a place like the Hammerstein Ballroom, some of the most knowledgeable fans in the world, they know what's going on, they know the storylines, they know the backstories, they know the history of the company. They know when to cheer, they know when to boo. They know who's good, they know who's bad. They know what the storyline is and what, what it means to each storyline. Better product. So yes, I do think that it should stay in areas where it's been a wrestling hotbed. And I think everybody else agrees. Now coming off of that, we're going to have our question of the week for this week. Recently we've seen the returns of two historically great tag teams, Team 3D and the Hardy Boys. The question of the week for this week is, what tag team or group would you like to see reform, even if it's just for one show? Let us know what you think. Hit us up on Facebook. Hit us up on Twitter. Put it down where? Down there in the comments. Now we're going to go into the good portion of the night, the stuff that actually I thought was enjoyable, 
first thing was the Abyss vs. Bram Monsters Ball match. I like what they're doing with Bram. I like the build that they're doing. I like that he is getting the best of Abyss. I like how they're using Abyss to build Bram. And I think Bram and Magnus as a team, or even separate, could be future stars in the company. Magnus has already had his run, but I think that was booked poorly. They need to build him again. And Bram, I thoroughly enjoy. I enjoy his brutality. I enjoy his style. I think he's going to be a big star at some point. Bram picks up the win after hitting Abyss in the stomach with Janice. Still controls Janice, which is a major sticking point to keep the plot going forward. Next up, we have the Bromans and DJ ZZ Mion versus Gunner, Samuel Shaw, and Ken Anderson. We see before the match Anderson telling Gunner he has reservations about Shaw. Anderson refuses to tag in Shaw, refuses to let Gunner tag him in. Shaw eventually comes, clears house, but ends up costing him the match. The Bromans and DJ, DJZ win. After the match, we see Anderson and Shaw having issues. Eventually leading the seed of these three having a feud at some point. Which is pretty cool, I think. The whole thing has been set up that way in a way that we're going to see Gunner and Anderson feud after it. Next up, we have the match that was booked the heaviest. Team Dixie Carter versus Team Bully Ray in a hardcore weapon street fight. War Games countdown rule kind of match with no cage, of course, because it's not War Games. But every 90 seconds, another, another wrestler would come in, thus making it even uneven, you know. So on and so forth, just like the War Games. First up, we start off with Ethan Carter III and Tommy Dreamer. Tommy gets the upper hand, Rhino comes out. Rhino and Tom, Ronnie and he said three, start working on Tommy, Devon comes out. Evens the score, then the bad guys get Snitsky coming out. Then Bully Ray comes out, then Reklon. And then last but not least, the surprise partner for Team Bully Ray, Al Snow and Head. We get a decently good hardcore match. It was a, there was a couple spots and a couple times in the match where it was just a clusterfuck, and you didn't know what was going on or why, or a couple of useless, meaningless spots. But other than that, a pretty solid match with Team Bully Ray coming out, setting up the table spot later in the night. How them winning this match led to that, I is another story, but they could have made it where they injured people, but they didn't. That's a different story about psychology later that has nothing to do with this. Overall, a decent hardcore match. Another, you know, a good surprise with Al Snow, for those people that didn't read the, the spoiler alerts, Al Snow was something, you know, probably one of the least people you expect to be the surprise guy, but definitely... A guy that was, you know, a guy that people love to see. Al Snow is someone that people are fans of. Now, last but not least in the good segment, we have the three-way match for the vacant X Division title. Sonata versus Loki versus Samoa Joe. Joe picks up the win in a very good match. I like it going forward. I like Joe being the face of the X Division. I think it's great. I think him carrying it is going to be good for the division. I think the more we see of guys like Loki, Sonata, Homicide, the more we're going to get back to where the X Division is almost on par, if not on par, with the World Heavyweight Championship. Now coming off of that, we're going to go right into our ratings for the week. If you've seen the show before, or even if you haven't, you know we have a 1 to 5 scale. A 1 to being the worst, five being the best. One's a Dixie Carter, two's a Rockstar Spud, three's a Gunner, four's a James Storm, five is Bobby Roode. I'm going to give this show a three, a Gunner. Although it doesn't seem like there was much I disliked or thought was in the so-so portion, the dislike and the so-so stuff 
is what's sticking in my brain and what's staying there. Also, the overall vibe of the show, for the past few weeks they've had the hardcore element and everything in there, but it felt like a TNA show, whereas the overall vibe of this show felt like an ECW tribute show. Where I think TNA needs to get back to where they're being TNA and not trying to be anybody else, not trying to be ECW, not trying to be WCW, not trying to be WWF, not trying to be All Japan Pro Wrestling, not trying to be Ring of Honor, trying to be TNA, which is what they had been doing. They had been creating an event, and it's been very good and very creative. Now this may be the abnormality. This might be the last, I don't know if it is, I think it's the last of the... Uh, the TV tapings where they shot three or four shows over a two-night period, so maybe it's just the vibe of having to guys having to wrestle so much that could have done that. But in my opinion, they need to get back to trying to be TNA and stop doing these shows where this was basically TNA's version of an ECW show. Just my opinion, but I give it a three, give it a gunner, some entertaining stuff. Overall, in the grand scheme of things, it's an episode of TNA that a month or two down the road, I'm not going to remember at all. But basically, that's all I have to say about that. My name is George Coles, and this has been another episode of Heel Heat.